When the original Star Wars hit theatres in 1977, it impacted every corner of the cultural landscape and changed Hollywood forever. Filmgoers obsessed over it, academics deconstructed it, and presidents celebrated it. The question is, who stole it? That's what we're here to find out. So expect shady fake Vaders, counterfeit Jedi Crusaders, and all the other things. Don't. You can't. These are my kids. A New Hope, as it came to be called, was released on the 25th of May and perhaps inevitably both Italy and Japan had cash-ins in theatres before the year was out. Italy was first with Alfonso Brescia's War of the Planets, an ugly throwback about a psychic computer trying to conquer Earth. I really think that that computer in there has just got to be drunk. Brescia made three more legitimate but horrible galactic adventures over the following couple of years. I will destroy you. Each using the same core cast, crew, and often footage to ensure they blend into a single murky soup of Star Trek leftovers. Don't say it's fascinating. No. The reason for all the Roddenberry is simple, and if you know the work of Alfonso Brescia, kind of predictable. He hadn't seen Star Wars. To be fair, it didn't come out in Italy until after he'd made the first two movies, so it's hardly a shock he got things wrong. But for the final couple, he'd figured out the importance of lightsabers and even begun to tackle discrimination in the droid community. I say creatures like this shouldn't be allowed to run around loose. They ought to be kept in zoos. Now, Tails, that's just prejudice. He has as much right to activate as we have, even if his skin is a different color. Lack of fidelity to the Star Wars canon isn't the reason I'm trying to avoid these things. The truth is, they're rubbish. As demonstrated by the vague ratings I've imposed. On a scale of 1 to 10, Oscar reflects how genuinely good, Tommy how entertainingly bad. And Brescia's films couldn't be much worse on either count. We're faced with disaster. But fear not, because something magical was happening down the road at Chinichita. Have you both gone mad? I only have logic and emotion circuits, no room for craziness. Producer Nat Washberger had just rejected Luigi Cozzi's Star Crash screenplay when he turned on the TV in his Rome apartment and saw these cues forming outside US theatres showing a new hope. He got back on the phone to Cozzi and offered him a green light as long as he played up the common elements. But Cozzi was more interested in Barbarella and Ray Harryhausen and took every opportunity to ignore the producer's demands for more Star Wars. Look! Amazon's on horseback! As a result, Star Crash, like most early cash-ins, keeps one foot in the past while relating its tale of smuggler types being recruited by President Von Trapp to save the galaxy from Ming. Put in use a mightiest weapon, the Doom Machine. With all the different elements involved, little works as it should, but more importantly, nothing fails as it shouldn't. The writing's idiotic, but each time they drop a crazy contrivance on us, it's amusing rather than trying. Imperial Battleship! Halt! The flow of time! But I assume Star Crash is best remembered as the David Hasselhoff fights stop-motion robots with a lightsaber movie. Look out! There's a follow-up, but not really, only it kind of is if the clearly legitimate title's anything to go by. Star Crash producer Luigi Nannarini wanted to reuse the effects footage and approached Luigi Cozzi about building another movie around it. Cozzi declined, but Nannarini went ahead anyway with Black Emmanuel director Bito Albertini at the helm, and together they made an offensively unwatchable coming-of-age romance that was later downgraded to a pawn. You galactic idiots! Before we leave Italy, there's one more early offering we obviously have to take a look at. We're approaching Planet Druidia, sir. Directed, according to the opening credits, by George Lewis, the humanoid is actually the work of Aldo Lardo, who's best known for Jallo classic Short Night of Glass Dolls. But that's a very different movie. It worked! It worked! He has been transmuted from a human into a humanoid. The story boils down to Lord Helmet and Professor Lunatic building a clone army to take over the galaxy. But there's much more going on, and it involves an order of Jedi archers, Barbara Bark's vampire queen, and a Padawan. They've taken Barbara! But believe it or not, our de facto hero is Bark's James Bond co-star Richard Keel. His name's Jaws, he kills people. And there are positives and negatives involved in that. 
On one hand, it's Richard Keel, and the relationship he shares with Robodog Kip is the most believable and touching in this video. But on the other, he's really more character actor than leading man. What's going on here, boy? This is my Robodog. The Humanoid was the first film from any country to properly mug a new hope for its particular designs and environments, like the desert planet where people get about in speeders. It's all quite likeable, but adds little beyond confusing vampires and Darth Vader's light blaster gauntlets. Worst Vader ever. This is Space Station Terra. This is Space Station Terra. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. What is it? A huge spaceship. It is approaching the station. What can we do? I've never seen such a thing. Like the early Italian cash ins, Japan's War in Space looks nothing like A New Hope despite being produced in reaction to it, which could again be down to the makers not having seen the movie they were meant to be emulating because it hadn't been released yet. But Japan had its own recently influential anime opera and space battleship Yamato, and an idea for a follow up to 15 year old submarine movie Atragon, so what we get is a mishmash of old and new. Basically, the bad guy still kidnaps the daughter of an eminent professor, but he does it with a battle wookie. As you can see, your daughter is in our hands. Our world is far from here, but our empire already has exploited a method to navigate in space freely. We can go all over at will the immensity of the galactic system. It's good enough, but not as good as this. <laughs> Message from Space was Toho competitor Toei's reaction to Star Wars, and they came to play. The domestic record-breaking budget delivering a lavish tale of evil empires, brave rebellions, and tangential weirdness. I have paid a small fortune. I paid it for you, my pretty, so you could... could be the bride of my son. <laughs> When samurai-like metal warlords, the Gavanas, enslave the peaceful planet of Jealousia, Princess Emma Reldra appeals to Earth for help, leading us to choose Vic Morrow as our champion. But I don't care about the Earth, I don't care about its politics. Dispatched promptly to Jealousia, he comes across a handful of oddballs called to arms by glowing walnuts issued by the princess. Teaming up, along with armed droid R2-3PO and an underused Sunny Chiba, Die! the group launch a counter-attack on the Gavanas. <laughs> So the plot and characters are pretty much a new hope, as is much of the music, although it never happens at quite the right moment. A nut inside a tomato. What's going on here? Like a lot of these early movies, Message from Space doesn't appear to know how space works. Despite being made more than a decade after people began doing this, we're told it's a thing we swim in, which may add up because apparently it can be sailed in 17th century galleons. <laughs> The energy to this movie is incredible. It's like the Lucas doctrine of faster and more intense, realized in pure movie form. It's been a long time since we've been out cruising like this. Uh oh. It's the space patrol. Stop! You are ordered to stop. Please obey the code. Will you stop? Shut up, man. You the bad wrong code. Hey, let's settle this with a chicken run. What's a chicken run? A chicken run banana. Let's go. Come on. The film didn't do as well abroad as was hoped, but it was popular at home and led to TV spin-off Galactic Wars, which in 1981 was adapted back into a movie that goes by many names, none of which will quite prepare you for the Chewy. We can be in and out of there in an hour. In fact, we can be back in time for happy hour. Love those banana daiquiris. <laughs> Space Ninja is built around naive young pilot Hayato, who goes looking for revenge when his family's murdered by the Gavanas. You will be avenged. Hooking up with a couple of smugglers who look familiar, plus their droid, a wizard and a princess in need of help, Hayato begins collecting magical eggs that will aid him in his battle with the Gavanis leader, who's returned from the dead as a woman from another dimension inside a giant golem. But I, I don't allow traitors to live. Don't kill me! 
It's aimed at a younger audience than the original film and it's obviously much cheaper, which means there's more jumping about in quarries. But it doesn't get boring thanks to a variety of amusing confusions. What's wrong? Why doesn't she explode? Yeah. Blow up, lady. Plus, it's all based around a planet called Kendall. This is Chief Kogar speaking to the land troops. Do you hear me? This is Captain Eager, sir. Someone on Kendall is trying to contact Earth for help. This 13th colony, this other world, where is it and what is it called? In a galaxy very much like our own, on a planet called Earth. Glenn Larson's original Battlestar Galactica is a Mormon allegory in which a colony of human refugees travel the galaxy looking for a mythical planet called Earth. And this two-hour opener intros Lorne Green's indomitable commander, Dirk Benedict's paper-thin man whore, and these... people. That's not Muffet. It's not even a real dagger. The show's renowned as a brazen rip-off of A New Hope, but the plot and characters have nothing in common beyond generic inevitabilities. It's really the effects that led to its reputation as a cash-in, and a cash cow because they've been sold on dozens of times to all kinds of movies. They're largely the work of a New Hope's John Dykstra, who'd formed his own company after leaving ILM, and their resemblance is undeniable. Fox filed suit against Universal for copyright infringement and the lawyers found a way to carry the debate on well beyond the show's early demise. We'll just, just have, have to talk, talk about, about it later, later if you're still, still around. around. Sequel Galactica 1980 picks up 30 years after the original and follows a largely new crew as they attempt to prepare Earth for invasion. Lorne Green returned with a beard, and our new heroes were Kent McCord and Barry Van Dyke, which earns it an entry in my good books. As do all the future technology culture clash shenanigans. Made on half the budget of its forebear, it lasted only half as long and was cancelled before Earth even found out what was going on. These hoodlums, as you call them, may be as important to mankind as the coming of the Messiah. Not yet. Richard Hatch, who appeared as Apollo in the original show, was behind another attempt to update it in 1999. I must prepare them for the second coming. But it didn't go anywhere, and the Sci-Fi Channel soon rebooted it their own way. Is that anything like the original Battlestar Galactica? Yeah. You know what's weird? It's practically a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Really? Huh. As the original Battlestar neared its debut, Larson turned to a complementary property he'd had an eye on. For 500 years, Buck Rogers drifted through a world in which reality and fantasy merged into a timeless dream. What am I? Who am I? What will I be? Buck Rogers in the 25th century was planned as the first of several TV movies, then given an unexpected theatrical release before effectively becoming a TV pilot when NBC decided to go the serial route. I guess they realized how irritating this version of the character is and went for a war of attrition with the audience. You're being subjective in your evaluation of Buck Rogers. The plot's hardly there, but hinges on Buck honey-trapping an alien, which is in line with his bafflingly hypersexualized persona, but not space adventuring. I confess I thought the princess had you beguiled. Well, I will say she had the nicest set of horns at the ball. Yes, it was an attractive hat. Watching this thing now prompts the same questions I had as a child. Why does Buck try to hump every woman who comes near him? And why can't there be more of the Jewish robot? <laughs> Beyond TV adaptations, North America's first theatrical cash-in came not from Hollywood, but Ontario. H.G. Wells' 1933 novel, The Shape of Things to Come, is a work of speculative fiction in which mankind evolves through multiple socio-political dispositions and spiritual complexions before arriving at a technologically driven benevolent dictatorship in which a population of polymaths enjoy an effective utopia founded on a fundamentally egalitarian communal construct. The 1979 movie has a robot that does this. How was that? It's terrific. And that's the highlight. 
Jack Palance's enormous head rotates above some trees, but there aren't many other reasons to bother with this thing. Needless to say, it has nothing to do with the book, not that it matters, so all the title does is bring to mind exactly the kind of cerebral futurism neither Star Wars nor this movie have anything to do with. Instead, it trudges through a grim account of a megalomaniacal administrator with an army of amusingly thuggish robots. <laughs> What's up, Vincent? The largest black hole I have ever encountered, Mr. Pizer. America's first major Star Wars knockoff was delivered in time for 1979's holiday season and involves the crew of a research vessel being ambushed by a black hole nobody knew about. That is, nobody apart from Maximilian Shell, who's trying to fly into it. There's a great cast, a John Barry score, and innovative effects, but it's unbearably by the numbers and the robot melodrama is plain weird. You can make it. It's no use, Vincent. My useful days are finished. But part of me goes with you. You'll never be obsolete. Just as the black hole finished disappointing theatre-goers, Roger Corman debuted a movie that was then the most expensive of his career, and remains one of the most popular. Ruthless invaders, a defenseless planet. Battle Beyond the Stars. In Battle Beyond the Stars, tyrannical warlord Sador threatens the peaceful people of Akir, whose only hope is to send humorless, high-handed teen Shad out into the galaxy for help. His first volunteer is a lonely weirdo recruited because she knows computers. But things improve when Shad stumbles on Sybil Danning's Valkyrie warriors and X-Men, Robert Vaughn's emotionless mercenary Gelt, and George Peppard's whoever George Peppard felt like being. Sixteen gamblers to carry my coffin. Then there are two flavors of Star Trek reject and this guy. Sador! Sador! With his magnificent seven in tow, Shad returns to Akir in a tumultuous battle that's shot and edited like a 1930s Flash Gordon serial. The otherwise impressive model work was partly overseen by a young James Cameron, who was paying his dues along with future big shots composer James Horner and writer John Sayles, who wrote things like this. No violent ending is beautiful. You've never seen a Valkyrie go down. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? And so to the crowning glory of the first wave of Star Wars cash-ins. Check the angular vector of the moon. Cash! Having acquired Flash Gordon in the early 70s, producer Dino De Laurentiis struggled to find a director for the movie. He wasn't interested in an eager young bearded chap who came calling, and Sergio Leone, Nicholas Rogue, and Federico Fellini all flirted but passed. With material like this, they'd have been flying blind on a rocket cycle. Flying blind on a rocket cycle? Look, I'm not proud, but you try finding a link to clips like these. De Laurentiis ultimately hired Mike Hodges to direct a script from Lorenzo Semple Jr., and the key creative trio was formed. This must be a mistake. The producer of neorealist masterpiece Knights of Kiberia, the director of gritty crime classic Get Carter, and the writer of TV's Batman. Flash, I love you, but we only have 14 hours to save the Earth. The result is unique and profoundly uplifting, with the appeal of an easygoing mainstream adventure and the aesthetic of pseudo-superhero mega-campery like Barbarella and Danger Diabolic. The boar worms. No! Not the boar worms! Everything's perfect. The music, the performances, and particularly the hypnagogic visuals, which demonstrate the spirit of fabled surrealist Gordon Onslow Ford was alive and well on set. Gordon's alive? Another US-UK co-production from 1980 opened another thematic avenue for the influence of A New Hope, when filmmakers noticed it was at least as much science fantasy as science fiction. If you're unsure of the difference, it's science fantasy that has Luke use the force to nail the Death Star's exhaust port. In science fiction, Picard would have made him turn his targeting computer back on and then someone would have explained how it worked. The core element is based on an FTL nanoprocessor with 25 bilateral kelolactrals. The Star Wars universe is rich with mythic antiquity and weird magic, so for it to encourage a number of more traditional sword and sorcery movies shouldn't have been a shock. Bolton! You will die!
Hawk the Slayer was one of the first and has its own Vader, Luke, R2, 3PO and so on. But there's a lot of this kind of thing and I imagine you have to be a particular type of British to find much to like. I punched a bloke in the face once for saying Hawk the Slayer was rubbish. Good for you. At least Jack Palance delivers as Darth Voltan. No, oh, I like a man with spirit. You want to see a violent male? Maybe you want to be treated like a child, taken across my knee and given a good spanking. Three years later, Hawk's director, Terry Marcel, made another fantasy adventure in Prisoners of the Lost Universe, which isn't a Star Wars knockoff, but does feature enough vague echoes for people to think it is. It isn't as memorable, but it is more fun than his previous movie and features a mad scientist who creates a window to another dimension, then falls through it. Most of these old-fashioned sword and sorcery movies came from the UK, where trying to recreate a mythical past has become a national obsession. My kingdom is no more. But Italy was also tempted, and their primary contribution is legendary. Your Hunter from the Future stars Red Brown, so it doesn't need Star Wars until about an hour in when it stops being a vague barbarian movie and introduces a mad sci-fi dictator who wants your for personal reasons. When you have inseminated this woman, you will die. Somehow this low-budget Turkish co-production based on an Argentinian comic book doesn't really work. Brown's well cast as a blunt tool and director Antonio Margariti at least saved money on costumes by recycling them from the humanoid. But I think it's one of those movies people remember more for its MST3K episode than for itself, because there are only a couple of fun bits. If a combination of barbarians, dinosaurs and spaceships is your thing, then Czechoslovakia's The Witch's Cave is more Star Warsy and comes with the novelty of being a Soviet take on whatever it is. I have to draw a line with these sword and forcery movies. Some fans credit the whole 80s fantasy craze to Star Wars, but I'm unconvinced, or maybe uninterested. But there is one worth seeking out. <laughs> Although part of Roger Corman's notorious Argentinian barbarian cycle, Wizards of the Lost Kingdom is a family movie and begins with tyrannical magician Shirker taking control of the kingdom of Axelholm. He goes after teenage wizard Simon because he's the only one with the power to stop him, but the boy's father magics him to safety with his pet Wampa Golfax. <laughs> Outside the kingdom, Simon the Wizard encounters wandering warrior Bo Svensson and the music from Battle Beyond the Stars, and together they embark on adventures which go nowhere, but some of which come from various of Roger Corman's earlier movies. Now, Kalgala! You fool! Give us the ring or we will destroy you! A follow-up arrived in 1989, and holy moly! David Carradine stars, which means at least one perpetually drunk performance is featured in every video I've made. Ragged warrior, prepare to die. Hey, I've been prepared for years, what about you? The plot's identical, only there are three kingdoms now and a much more adult tone, but this thing's so bad it has an active contempt for the audience. Can we talk this over? I mean, besides that little thing with the sword, I really have a pretty good record. Silence! All right, there was that time with your nephew, but he told me he was an Adakian slaver. <laughs> It's that time when we turn the spotlight around and look at what inspired whichever movie it is that got the world all hot under the collar. Usually that means giving a brief explanation of its two or three key inspirations. So what were our new hopes? Star Wars owes much to the works of Joseph Campbell. The John Ford film The Searchers. Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. The world's myths and legends. There's a real Nazi feel to, to the bad. Richard Wagner's Ring Cycle. Japanese warrior movies. Especially the film Hidden Fortress. Where the cutting's concerned, it's the Russians. The legend of King Arthur. John Carter of Mars. Soap opera. 
Frank Herbert's Dune. The Lord of the Rings. Lawrence of Arabia. And the Only. 2001. Triumph of the Will. Old War Movies. The Dambusters. Swashbuckle. Seven Samurai. Flash Gordon. Wizard of Oz. Metropolis. Buck Rogers. The Odyssey. The Iliad. Beowulf. Social issues. David and Goliath. Political issues. Watergate. Spiritual issues. Yeah, Jack Kirby. Old stories. And it's one of the few pieces of originality over the last 25 years. Okay. As the entirety of human cultural history was apparently an influence on A New Hope, it might be an idea to stay focused on a couple of points. And nobody mentioned the Skylark or Lensman series written by E.E. E. Smith, which between them feature hundreds of familiar scenes and tropes, including Death Stars, Jedi Orders and lightsabers. We had it for Star Wars. In writing Star Wars, Lucas was primarily inspired by the timeless themes of classic science fiction and fantasy literature, particularly the grander works of Smith, Burroughs, Herbert and Tolkien, which have much in common. You need to tell the same story over and over again every generation. When people credit films and filmmakers with influencing him, they're really only talking about the film language Lucas used to convey those themes, and that comes from all over the place, but particularly pre-war adventure movies, post-war war movies, the classic Hollywood western, and the films of Akira Kurosawa, particularly The Hidden Fortress. What the There's a reason these forebears are so diverse, and it's down to them not being diverse. I consciously set about to recreate myths and the, and the classic mythological uh, motifs. Lucas was obsessed with mythic folk stories from all over the world, and in particular what they had in common, and that's what led him to the key to Star Wars. It was a great gift, uh, and, uh, and a very important moment. If I don't, you know, it's possible that if I had run across that, I would still be writing Star Wars today. The narrative model known as the hero's journey was defined by Joseph Campbell in his 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces and it's essentially an equation for the story of Star Wars. I would go back and sort of check it against the classic models of the hero's journey and that sort of thing. In the 15 second version of the hero's journey, an innocent is called to adventure. They meet a wise mentor who exposes them to a wider world, where they encounter new friends, make a host of new enemies, overcome a series of challenges, and ultimately conquer a villain before returning home a changed hobbit. The reason the hero's journey is so popular in cinema is that it's always been popular in all forms of storytelling. Campbell didn't invent it, he just formalised it. What's what he was trying to do is find the common threads through the various mythology, through the, the religions. Star Wars has an abundance of influences, but classical mythology has always driven it, whether or not filtered through popular culture. I'm not sure Flash Gordon inspired more than enthusiasm and questionable wipes. He was very depressed because he had just come back and they wouldn't sell him Flash Gordon. That's right. What a, what a limitation had you gotten Flash Gordon, I wonder. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't give it, give it to me. I'm not sure there's much point cataloguing the elements we're looking for in a knockoff. They seem pretty well known, so I did this instead. <laughs> After the initial rush of confused cash-in, Star Wars was refined down to a handful of easily manageable templates. Sword and Forcery was one, but the most popular was probably The Adventures of Han Solo. Roger Corman's Space Raiders involves the holiday special stowing away on the Millennium Falcon, which like all spaceships in 1980s Roger Corman movies is played by footage from Battle Beyond the Stars. At least this time it isn't piloted by Shad, because there's a real captain at the helm. That's him pausing to crack a beer in the middle of a dogfight. My name is Hawk. Used to be Colonel Hawkins. C.W. Hawkins. Back when being in the space service really meant something. The Empire's after the kid and they've sent Harry and Marv to catch him, but Hawk eventually agrees to take him home and the two bond along the way. It's a touching relationship with Hawk becoming a role model for the child. 
teaching him how to drink beer, smoke cigars and cut his fingers off. Will you take me home now? In return, the boy gets Hawk and every one of his crew killed. I don't know if it's a buried treasure as such, but this underdog with recycled effects and music should get more love. It feels like a Disney movie got drunk. Have a beer, hot shot. God damn rocks! <laughs> Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone has an underpowered Peter Strauss attempting the rescue of three unidentified refugees with help from Molly Ringwald I'm not a scab girl, I'm not out of my diaper! and Ernie Hudson You like fly shit on the window. First little breeze that blows and you're gone. Like many apparent Star Wars clones of the mid-80s, it's actually a backdoor Bad Max, but with the advantage of Michael Ironside as a crazy cyborg. You have a very enviable life force. A life force you're going to share with me. But you said if I made it through, I'm free! I lied. <laughs> Nobody talks free. In a different distant future, ice has become the most valuable commodity in the galaxy, leading Captain Jason and his bygone band of pirates to plunder it for a living. But they bite off more than they can chew when they attempt to rob the flagship of the all-powerful Templars of Mithra and become embroiled in a children's adventure involving involuntary castration, beheadings and robot pimps. Y'all want pumps up, kiddies? The game with the ice pirates is trying to figure out who it was really made for. It's around 25% robots bumping into things, which implies a target audience of 12-year-olds. But if Space Raiders taught us that fake Han Solos aren't suitable role models for children, Ice Pirates <laughs> indicates they shouldn't be allowed in the same room. What happened to we rape, we pillage? Our hero's self-control doesn't last, and he becomes the only Han Solo to kidnap a Princess Leia because he wants to bullseye her womp. Cut to a scene for tiny children. <laughs> The original concept was much grander, but when the budget was cut from 20 to 8 million dollars, Stuart Raffle, yup, him, was brought in to rewrite and shoot a more comedic take. At least the inevitable was consensual. Shouldn't you be at the controls? If you insist. Han Solo's world-weary anti-hero was the flavour of the 80s, but it was Luke Skywalker's naive chosen one at the heart of the era's most dignified New Hope clone. Greetings, Starfighter. You have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Sur and the Kodan Armada. Yeah, yeah. Get ready, prepare for last off. Having beaten the record on an arcade machine that's actually a covert alien testing device, disenchanted teen Alex Rogan's approached in his trailer park purgatory by charismatic alien Centauri. Store's closed, mister. I'm not here for cigarettes or bubblegum, my boy. Can you tell me the name of the person who broke the record on that game over there, and where I might find him? Informed he's the only person in the galaxy who can defeat the evil Xur and his Kodan Empire before they destroy the Rylan Star League, Alex's heroes journeyed by surprise and made to conquer his fear. Unusually for the time, the space scenes are computer-generated, with the centerpiece Gunstar Fighter designed by a New Hope's Ron Cobb to be easy to model in 3D. It's all quite primitive, but this movie has too much joy in its heart for anything like that to matter. Lois! Lois! I grew up with it, and when Alex leaves home for the last time and little brother Lewis hops on the game, it can get a little dusty. Green Starfighter, you have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Zor and the Kodan Armada. Lorca and the Outlaws is rather different. Now I won't forget your face. On a remote mining planet, a droid government preys on a human workforce. But fortunately there's a rebellion, kind of. And it's led by Lorca, with help from faithful robot Grid. One day, you will see a real horse. 
This Aussie oddity was directed by a New Hope set decorator, Roger Christian, though that title hugely underrepresents his contribution. Don't feel too bad for him though, because he went on to make Battlefield Earth, which is probably a closer indicator of what to expect here. Do you want lunch? He was trying to do something different, but it's so boring. There's an atmosphere though, and new wave performance art for some reason. Red paint, eagle feathers, coyote calling, it has begun. Whether Australian, American or even Japanese, most of these movies were made with at least one eye on the international market, which, believe it or not, demanded something. Those made for a domestic market, though, could theoretically do whatever they wanted, and in Turkey they generally did. Turkish Star Wars was unveiled in 1982 amid a frenzy of collaboration between director Çetin Inanç and deity Junit Arkin, who made 20 movies together over a five-year period. Then, as now, this one's by far the most popular. <laughs> Beyond the borrowed footage, Turkish Star Wars has nothing to do with real Star Wars. It's actually about two intergalactic fighter pilots who end up on a desert planet trying to beat up rocks and help the locals overthrow a warlord. But it's not a huge shock that Inant should steal Star Wars anyway. Like many of his contemporaries, he was always lifting music from Hollywood movies, and on occasion had already taken footage too. At least it doesn't prevent the theft of music from elsewhere. What is kind of a surprise is how ineptly the borrowed footage is handled. Obviously they didn't account for the ratio being anamorphic, but it's effectively cut together at random. I didn't re-edit this, and for some reason it plays out in the background of the cockpit shots. Cuts and all. How's that rock coming? Inanch had allegedly planned to shoot his own models, only for them to be destroyed in a storm. So he bribed a guard at a Turkish distributor and ran off a copy of A New Hope. Today the movie is a cult favourite and has much more going for it than the footage from A New Hope. If you can track down the limited edition Blu-ray, I highly recommend it. For years, the only available version of the movie was a ropey TV rip but then American filmmaker Ed Glazer and British academic Ian Smith, both of whom have written books you might be interested in if you like these videos, teamed up to acquire the only known 35mm print of the movie. Their efforts, aided by the financial support of King's College London, have helped make the world a better place. There's a follow-up in 10 seconds of an old man fighting the only bearable thing about it. But Turkish Star Wars isn't the only foreign language cash-in curio. There's also the Brazilian one with Seth Rogen. <laughs> that A New Hope came along in the era of both disco and Brazilian comedy troupe The Bunglers is unfortunate, but that anyone decided to combine the three in one movie is demented. <laughs> When not subject to dance fever, our heroes briefly battled Darth Vader in the desert. But most of this thing speeded up fights and chases into cut with unrelated bits, none of which seem to have been rehearsed and none of which contribute to the story, unlike the thrilling scenes of Capoeira. Only a little better is Poland's Mr. Blob in the Universe. It's an anthology movie in which each tale is a chilling depiction of mankind's dystopian future, kind of like a Polish black mirror. The twist is the storyteller's a singing maniac in a tree. <laughs> Oh, 
można nawet było spotkać się z czarami. I wonder if Iranian kids had any more luck. When a Wizard of Oz framing device lands two children on an A-wing headed for the Imperial command ship, Iranian Han Solo makes it his mission to rescue them from the evil harmonica dwarves. It transpires the Empire's kidnapping children from all over the world, but before rescuing them there are capers, which allow Han to concoct an intricate plan to defeat Darth Toaster. It's a hit and miss affair, but far superior to the bunglers or Mr. Blob, even before it recreates the deleted scene from The Empire Strikes Back in which Han tricks a Wampa into falling out of a spaceship. While we're doing an international tour of kids' adventures, I should probably mention India's Arya Man. Our title character's a prince raised to protect his people from a variety of James L. Jones villains, and this is one of the few properties to take its cues from the prequels, which means shiny spaceships and an interminable political component, which is used to fill gaps between this kind of thing. It's a TV show, so I'm bending the rules, and it works a lot like a serial, with too many episodes full of too much repetition and a rationing approach to entertainment, which means one scene of action for every ten of dialogue, a ratio I can live with when the action looks like this. Japan didn't stop making a New Hope imitations after its initial theatrical endeavours, it just confined them to television, where children's shows were big business. One of the most popular was Star Wolf, which found its way to the West when it was re-edited into feature film Fugitive Alien. This is space control. The Wolf Raiders from Valna Star have been attacking the Earth. They seem to be regrouping, but they're likely to come back. All spaceships on route MMS 600 be on the alert. Fugitive Alien predicts The Force Awakens when, faced with the inhumanity of orders to kill unarmed civilians, Hey, do you want to play? Stormtrooper Ken chooses to defy the chain of command. I don't kill women and children! Then stand back and let me do it! He escapes in an X-Wing but soon breaks down and needs to be rescued by the crew of the Bacchus Three. Rocky? Yes, sir? We're going to rescue him. I don't think that's a very good idea. Despite dissent from pilot Rocky, Ken joins the crew, and together they do much high-strung adventuring against the backdrop of interstellar war and Rocky's complaining. I think we should get rid of Ken. The original show was based on Edmund Hamilton's novels of the same name, which many have pointed to as an influence on George Lucas. This feature-length contraction is the work of American producer Sandy Frank, who's best known for retooling anime series Gatcha Man as Battle of the Planets, and importing Gamera to the West. Right on! <laughs> By the mid-80s, he was looking for Star Wars-inspired live-action shows, or tokusatsu, suitable for the US video market, and Star Wolf must have seemed a great fit with its derivative characters and relentless action. I think this is one mission where you're not going to need whiskey for excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I'll need a stiff belt when I get back, though. And there was enough material to form a follow-up featuring an incredible climax with X-Wings doing a trench run and Ken finally facing off against arch-nemesis Halkin. Hello, Star Wolf. Now die! No, you're the one that's gonna die! <laughs> Frank also recycled the pre-New Hope series Mighty Jack and somehow passed it off as a new release. Mission accomplished. Now let's go home. The repackaging of Japanese TV shows as American feature films worked better when done with anime. 1982's Space Adventure Cobra is a reworking of an arc from the kids' show of the same name, and revolves around the moronic Cobra coming to the aid of an alien princess and her hologrammatic professor. Hey, how's it hanging, prof? It's an Adventures of Han Solo movie rendered with incredible artwork and a rich assortment of characters and scenarios. Relax and enjoy the ride. 
Look out! Snow gorillas! In 1984, the Lensman novels, which we've established as a key influence on Star Wars, were adapted into an anime series in Japan, and from there chopped up into a couple of movies. The Secret of the Lens and the Power of the Lens, both following the adventures of wide-eyed innocent Kim, who's chosen by fate to inherit the magical talisman of a dying Green Lantern type. I suppose you want to know something about that lens. Yes. It seems to be whatever the plot needs it to be. Source of power, storage device, shield, communication system, only magically fused to the owner's hand. Fortunately, Kim has an Obi-Wan to show him how to use it. I too wear the lens. Not to mention a Han to help him rescue a Leia, and he also has the stolen plans to the Empire's secret superweapon in the memory banks of his lens, because this is basically just a new hope. So of course Kim is a simple farm boy from a backwater planet who's leaving home to become a fighter pilot. Your son's decision to leave is for the past. He's 18, my friend. When I was his age, I wouldn't have settled for piloting a harvester. Lucas borrowed much from the Lensman series, but not that much. The flow of influence is going largely the other way here. In fact, this movie owes more to A New Hope than it does Lensman, which the author's estate noticed and was horrified by, which is why they've apparently barred any kind of re-release for the last 30 years. Wherever the details came from, what's always striking about these Heroes Journey movies is how universal the generalities are. I am Mentor, Guardian of the Lens, and my story is as old as the cosmos itself. If you like the idea of an animated Star Wars but don't like anime, I don't know what's wrong with you, but someone made you a movie. In the spice mines of Kessel, slave boy Orin finds a magical sword that leads him off-world with a cowboy who seems to be Robert Forster. Together they rescue a princess from a generic but literal cartoon villain and befriend a slutty femdroid. I don't like to cover parodies because technically I don't think they're proper knockoffs, and generally I don't think they're very funny. Yeah. Some of the short amateur classics are good. Does this thing do light speed? You bet your asteroid, kid. But no matter how entwined in the history of the franchise, they're not for this video. And nor are TV tributes from overindulged onerists, even if I like them. I love you. F off. Gremloids, though, clearly is for this video. <laughs> The plot's almost as haphazard as the Bunglers movie, but on paper at least appears promising. Having lost track of the rebel blockade runner carrying the Death Star plans, Lord Buckethead arrives on Earth by mistake, but carries on unaware. You will tell me where you have hidden the secret transmissions or you shall die. Bizarrely, here in the UK, two candidates identifying as Lord Buckethead have stood in general elections, and in 2017, history's stupidest IP battle was settled when the Gremloids' rights holders forced one to alter his costume and change his name to Count Binface. I thank my fellow candidates in all their glory, uh, Lord Buckethead, uh... But for most of us, there's probably only one real Star Wars parody, and it doesn't involve any kind of waste receptacle. I can't breathe in this thing! Spaceballs was late to the game, but became a firm favourite among juvenile fans due to its well-targeted humour and mildly inappropriate tone. I see your Schwartz is as big as mine! The famous merchandising routine was inspired by Lucas himself, who gave Brooks his blessing to make the film on the proviso no merchandise be produced. Spaceballs, the flamethrower! <laughs> that kids love this one. In fact, Lucas liked the idea so much, he contributed some unused model shots and had ILM collaborate with John Dykstra on the effects. Suck! 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 Of course, it does involve a waste receptacle. Suck. May the Schwartz be with you! In the latter part of the 80s, Star Wars entered what George Lucas refers to as its quiet period. The kids who'd grown up with it had moved on, and other than a few bones thrown to hardcore fans, the franchise lay pretty much dormant until the arrival of the special editions. Hey, what are you guys doing here? It was also a quiet period for Star Wars knockoffs, but it kicked off with a classic. <laughs> Ah! 
There are many reasons why Space Mutiny is so revered, aside from it being among the most popular episodes of MST3K. We put our faith in blast hard cheese. The windows that ruin the effect of being on a spaceship. The concrete floors that also ruin the effect of being on a spaceship. And the remarkably familiar model shots. Good shot, Ryder. Lifted from Battlestar Galactica, they're occasionally played backwards in an attempt to make them look different, but not always, which is confusing. And why bother when they feature Battlestar insignias anyway? Forget it! I don't need this. I won't get too into this movie here because I have a video looking at its extraordinary history. But the plot's taken from Battlestar 2. Cameron Mitchell plays Commander Adama, Red Brown Starbuck, and his real-life wife is love interest and daughter of Adama. Listen, lady! Doctor! Doctor! In true Battlestar fashion, they take care of the heroics while a few nutters try to surrender to the Cylons. Are there any other of you that wish to confuse freedom with treason? The final of these things released prior to the prequels was Wing Commander, a mid-budget adaptation of the popular flight sim with a major debt to a new hope. I need you to hand deliver an encrypted communications chip to her captain. Why me? I fought alongside your father in the Pilgrim Wars. He was a good man. This much-mocked blend of Das Boot, Top Gun and Battlestar Galactica stars Freddie Prince Jr. as feeble-minded throttle jockey Lieutenant Christopher Blair, who adds a big lump of Luke Skywalker to the mix due to him being the last of a gifted race of pioneers known as the Pilgrims, ancient spacefarers with a supernatural ability to know which way they're going. For five centuries, they defied the odds. They embraced space, and for that, they were rewarded with the gift of a flawless sense of direction. Prince is very funny, spending the whole movie in a blank state of confused amazement and leaving the inaudible histrionics to Matthew Lillard's maniac. They help make Wing Commander far more entertaining than it's supposed to be, as does the film's obsession with anachronistic warfare. Fighter planes are flown by pilots in leather hats, while the giant craft battle like pirate ships and use sonar in deep space. There's an early crack at bullet time, hilariously excitable character dynamics, and proper actors including David Suchet, Jürgen Prochnow and David Warner. Why do you want hair? All of whom make Freddie Prince Jr.'s vacuous gurning even funnier. And Mark Hamill, star of the game's cutscenes, shows up in a cameo as the ship's computer. Hello, I'm Marlon. Must have been funny watching someone else react to this kind of dialogue. I don't have the faith. It's not faith, it's genetics. Or not react. You may have expected the prequels to foment a new era of Star Wars knockoffs, but they didn't really have any effect at all. I suppose there were distractions. We're Cheap Star Wars knockoffs are still a thing in the digital age, though. Their titles ever less imaginative and more belligerent, and their genealogy often quite confusing. Princess of Mars is a bargain bin take on the later John Carter, which was influenced by Star Wars, which borrowed from the John Carter book series, which itself was inspired by Tarzan. It's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Rendered through the asylum's machinery of mediocrity, these movies are just a reminder that Caspar Van Dien's career isn't what it used to be. I don't need you to tell me about my past. I lived it. But the good thing is they're unrepresentative of modern force exploitation, which effectively began in 1997 with The Fifth Element, and can be characterized by occasional mainstream extravaganzas that, unlike the low-budget knockoffs of yesteryear, aren't supposed to remind audiences of Star Wars, and are supposed to be the next big thing. While you were still learning how to spell your name, I was being trained to conquer galaxies. Battlefield Earth might be the most notorious. In the run-up to release, John Travolta repeatedly proclaimed it to be the new Star Wars, which is quite reasonable when we consider what else he compared it to. There's so much uh, that, was great. That, was that reminded me of Pulp Fiction, but in the year 3000 instead, the kind of dark humor it had and the uh, cool kind of hip qualities that the movie had. Actor Forrest Whitaker regretted it. Cinematographer Giles Nutkin disowned it, but it was original writer J.D. Shapiro, who accepted its Razzie Award as the worst movie of the decade, who really got a handle on it. Uh, it's not fair to call it a train wreck because people actually want to watch a train wreck. After The Fifth Element and Battlefield Earth came abject failures like Aragon, Disney's belated John Carter adaptation, Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets, and Jupiter Ascending, which is at least funny. You've never been stung by a bee, have you? So why are all these movies so awful? Maybe it's something to do with A New Hope's balancing of its contrasting heroes and their objectives. The Star Wars knockoffs that work best tend to follow the smuggler's journey, not the hero's journey. 
and a Han Solo story will always feature less baggage, more choice, and a more relatable, amusing hero. You want to run this ship? Yes. Well, you can't. Serenity delivers one of the best and pushes the Star Wars universe as far as it will go, making it even more used, what was that? more adult and more derivative of old samurai movies, and particularly westerns. Going on a year now, I ain't had nothing. Twix my nethers weren't run on batteries. Oh, God. So that was my rough guide to around 40 of the more intriguing Star Wars knockoffs of the last few decades. But there are more. Many simply take place in the kind of humdrum intergalactic environment that filmmakers like Ridley Scott credit Lucas with inventing. Others borrow a spaceship here or a costume there and work them into a movie that might have nothing to do with Star Wars. Or perhaps they'll just put them on the poster. There's no Millennium Falcon in Planet of Dinosaurs. Then there are spin-offs, which I don't have time for here, but in the case of the prequels, do lead to a final thought. Uh, suppose I started this sentence, I want you to finish it for me. George Lucas revolutionized movies and movie making by... Finish that sentence. By luck. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to George Lucas. Today, the popular narrative paints George Lucas as a hack who simply rearranged other people's ideas and got lucky. That's the view I fell into following the prequels. But while it's true there isn't much in Star Wars that's completely original, and it's true that Lucas was fortunate to rely on such talented collaborators, it's also true that nobody else has ever made this kind of movie work in such a universal and inspirational way. The perfect film to inspire a sense of wonder. Turn me round 180 degrees. It actually gave me a big sort of kick up the backside. I'd be the first to say George Lucas isn't a natural director. If I forget to say action or cut, just step in and say action and cut. But producers are filmmakers too. And after seeing so many failed attempts to recreate the magic of Star Wars, I've come to the conclusion he must have been pretty good at that. That isn't the point I was expecting to end on. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. <laughs>